Thank you. Um, today, I'm going to try and <laughs> shorten my presentation and finish it in 20 minutes. I'm going to try and read Watsuji's uh, Nihongi Rishisoshi from, uh, on, with, by focusing on um, the way he perceived and um, accounted for Confucianism and um, modernity in, um, in, in the work. I'm sorry, I, I think somebody has their mic on. No? Okay, uh, sorry. Um, so, and I wanted to say uh, when I sent in this abstract, it was actually a very, very, very rough draft of an article that I was, um, I was sending uh, for a book. And um, as things stand now, um, the article will appear in a few days. Uh, but this is a long-term project for me, uh, looking at the way, trying to figure out uh, ways to define or redefine uh, Confucianism and its, um, um, its contact with uh, what is called modern in Japan is a long-term project. So I, I really would um, appreciate any comment, uh, guidance, um, questions you might have. Um, the... The starting point for this, I'm by no means um, a scholar in Watsuji, um, as the, um, as, um, I'm sorry, my apologies. So my, my interest in this started from actually looking at Confucianism and the relationship it had with um, the idea of an emerging nation at the end of the Edo and um, in, the, in the Meiji period. So um, dealing, dealing with uh, this particular uh, topic means that uh, for me, I always hit a rough spot when we're talking about uh, Confucianism or the, the possibility of still engaging with Confucianism uh, philosophically, especially in the post-war period. So um, I started looking into um, what scholars are doing about or how uh, scholars are um, redefining uh, Confucianism um, in China and how they're reframing that conversation in China. And um, especially after uh, Kiri Paramore's um, Japanese Confucianism, a cultural history, there's this question that just doesn't give me peace. Is there actually no way for us to uh, talk about Confucianism and its experience in modern or pre-modern Japan without uh, always associating it with uh, conservative and backward elements in philosophy? And um, is there any way to use this uh, Sigurdsson's um, word? Is there any way for us to uh, perceive Confucianism today as remedial in any way um, when it comes to um, Japan's um, modern and pre uh, postmodern uh, philosophy? So uh, why I stopped at Nihon uh, Rinri Shisoshi is um, the, there are a few reasons, but the most important for today's uh, topic is the fact that uh, Watsuji seems to offer a framework um, that will allow for this kind of philosophical path forward for Confucianism in uh, modern and uh, post-war Japan. Um, and um, his framework gives me um, the possibility of redefining Confucianism in a way that uh, it can account for its philosophical porousness and um, multiplicities of uh, manifestations. So this is my um, main idea for today. And I'm going to uh, take a quick look at the chapters on um, Edo uh, ethical thinking and Meiji ethical thinking. And in the end, I'm going to try and explain how I saw this possibility of a way forward, uh, a path forward in terms of Confucianism and modernity. So um, I feel like here I have to go back to our um, to uh, Maruyama, who is actually to this day, I think he's probably the single most um, influential um, intellectual uh, talking about um, uh, Confucianism and uh, Tokugawa in the Tokugawa period. So to this day, it's still uh, very much respected um, theory. So just um, briefly summarizing his idea, um, following that dissolution, uh, dissolution of the Shushigaku mode of thought throughout the Edo period, um, his studies in the, in the intellectual history of uh, Tokugawa 
in the end points to Confucianism's um, inherent incapacity to break down the deeply ingrained feudalism and um, its ultimate role in um, basically supporting the feudal status quo and impeding any kind of socio-political evolution. So um, in his argument, um, the, the Tokugawa society's rigid class separation is essential to, uh, to his theory on Confucianism and modernity. And as he emphasizes, he does say that um, the consciousness arising in such an environment, in a rigid environment, inclined towards a narrow conservatism, uh, lacking in public spirit and open-mindedness. And um, while Watsuji himself also has um, many um, similar points to Maruyama's um, theory, I will focus here on, um, on the main difference I found between them. Um, mainly the fact that Watsuji has a more forgiving account of Confucianism. Uh, of course, his work is also cultural history. It's not a philosophical investigation uh, per se, but um, in the end, um, it's relevant that he presents Confucianism as both restrictive, um, but also creative. And uh, while he sees in Confucianism a streak that legitimizes the feudal uh, social order, and um, it, it points to a very stagnant and intellectually and socially obtuse kind of Confucianism, he also sees in that Confucianism um, a seed of, modern, of a modern consciousness, or at least a proto-modern consciousness. Um, so it, he does point at its um, creative nature and porous nature throughout his, um, his uh, book. And uh, one important idea he puts forth is how Confucianism actually acted as a, a sort of ethics before ethics, before um, the discipline was um, brought in from abroad in the Meiji period, Confucianism was what um, showed um, interest in um, discovering universal ethical principles. So, um, in this discussion, he also talks about how Confucianism has been capable of adaptation and intellectual porousness. Um, especially, he made this discussion um, surrounding the, the emergence of a Chonin spirit, Seishin. So um, how does he exactly account for this contradiction, uh, contradictory uh, value of Confucianism in, in the early modern period, in the Edo period? Um, how, does, how does he uh, make sense of Confucianism being both traditionalistic and creative? And um, there he comes with a category, he, he, cate he uh, comes up with these two categories of Kangaku Confucianism and Minshu or uh, Shigaku Confucianism. So um, in a very, very broad translation, I would say that Kangaku Confucianism would be something uh, of like Orthodox Confucianism. And Minshu Confucianism, I, I called it popular Confucianism, but it, it's it's a problematic term. So I will um, I will stick with Minshu Confucianism for now. So um, the hint to this interpretation um, comes from the preface to the book, um, how how to read this um, contradictory um, statement. Because in the preface, he actually posits that all historical processes, um, in, including ethical thinking, one assumes, um, are affected by two essential um, vectors, so to speak. Uh, one is the spatiotemporal uh, limitation um, and the simultaneously present and divergent forces of creativity and traditionalism. So uh, within his, this framework, his approach to Confucianism um, already seems markedly different from um, Maruyama's. And um, if here, Watsuji identifies these two divergent directions in the evolution of Edo Confucianism, um, largely abiding by the same two principles um, I, I just uh, mentioned, uh, the traditional and the creative um, streaks, uh, vectors. And uh, within this framework, uh, for him, Kangaku Confucianism um, seems to represent the traditionalistic direction, that uh, direction which was inward looking, stagnant, um, focused on maintaining the status quo. While on the other hand, Minshu Confucianism um, seems to represent the creative direction, which was founded um, on its search for universality and openness in inter-tradition uh, tradition, uh, dialogue. So uh, therefore, he does seem to um, emphasize here the intellectual porousness in this streak of Confucian 
scholarship. And um, this is actually the part um, that he dedicates the most attention to in the Edo chapters. And he focuses on its particularly creative and universalistic potential. And he shows how, um, how the spread of Minshu Confucianism um, happened, how, how he came to talk about the Minshu Confucianism, how Confucianism actually went from the top layers in, um, in the military class into the lower layers and then into uh, towards the Chonin classes, only to return in the end um, in a completely, um, in an altered ma manner. So um, he, uh, he gives a lot of uh, space to this argument. So um, we see here that whereas Maruyama gives very little thought to the Chonin class in, in terms of their um, print on Confucianism, in the scheme that uh, Watsuji proposes, uh, the Chonin have uh, and their um, status in that um, rigid feudal social order um, is actually essential. He also notes like Maruyama that uh, the Chonin did not really possess any political power but on the other hand, he also doesn't seem to give too much uh, weight to that um, because he, he focuses more on the opposite point, on how this social order uh, imposed by the Tokugawa Bakufu was uh, in fact very lax and um, which pointed to social mobility. And this uh, in turn was a very much supported and kind of pushed by Confucianism. So Confucianism in this uh, logic um, continued to respond to the social changes in society and um, adapt. So um, he gives um, several examples, but because I'm trying to uh, move towards the discussion, uh, please allow me to skip. And if you have questions about it, I will try to um, answer. Um, moving on uh, to the Meiji chapters, however, um, things are not so simple. Um, it's Although it's somewhat easier to identify Watsuji stands on Confucianism and modernity and that emergence of a proto-modern consciousness in the Edo period, the same is really not the case for um, Meiji. So here the bulk of his interest in these chapters, uh, the bulk of his interest um, is aimed not at Confucianism's uh, destiny, philosophical or cultural, but at actually grasping the crux of Japan's modern issue, uh, Kokutairon and the rise of an increasingly illiberal mood in politics. And throughout this discussion, of course, uh, Confucianism comes up again and again um, in the debate between Nishiyamane and Nishimura Shigeki, um, how, um, how appropriate it is to adapt and adopt a Western morality, how it should be combine, combined with what elements from Confucian morality. Um, he, he again talks about the Confucian uh, loyalty in, uh, in the arguments surrounding the constitution and the rescript and um, more so in the part about you know, Tetsujiro and his, um, his role in the spread of um, that type of kokutairon, that very anachronistic type of kokutairon and that Confucian sounding morality, which is not quite Confucian um, as he also makes the point. So um, here we are just left to our own devices to interpret how um, how Confucianism evolved in this, um, in this stage. So uh, here again, we'll have to, um, abiding by his, uh, going back to his framework, uh, we can try and interpret how Confucianism um, behaved at this confluence of traditionalistic and creative forces of history in the Meiji period. So um, in this period, when, where he covers the Meiji uh, period, um, I was telling you that he doesn't seem to give so much space or thought to Confucianism itself, um, but it seems to be, uh, the entire period seems to be um, that renegotiated intellectual space of the Meiji period is focused on that single-minded quest uh, to find a national morality, which is also uh, misunderstood. So here he also makes a very important point of um, how um, the idea of um, nation was misunderstood, um, but this is what he focuses on. So um, here we see that uh, Confucianism is reduced to a certain degree to an adjacent position, 
um, because it all of a sudden it becomes only one of several available intellectual resources, and um, they can this these resources can uh, very well be used by traditionalists or individualists uh, because these were the categories he um, 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 mentions here. So as such, his exploration doesn't um, doesn't really go too uh, too far into um, following the Confucian legacy. Um, but what can be inferred about it from these chapters if we go back to his framework? Um, so if we if we go back to um, to these forces of traditionalism and creativity um, that would function in the Meiji period as well as in the Edo period, we have to presume that the Confucian strands of ethics continue to be affected by the same basic principles. So. Um, Although they're redisposed in the Meiji period, they're still, um, they're, they still exist. And while Watsuji doesn't really touch upon this, um, his references to the Meiji strand of Mito um, scholarship suggest a shift um, in its orientation, in Mito uh, school's orientation. Uh, while it had originated um, in his um, opinion from the creative strand of Confucianism during the Edo period, the Mito-inspired scholars of the Meiji period exhibit a clear shift from its originally creative tendency towards an increasingly traditionalistic one. So following its association with the Meiji political authority, uh, Mito now seems to exhibit the same type of stagnation and intellectual obtuses, uh, obtuseness encountered earlier in the Kangaku strand of Edo Confucianism, only this time also paired with a very modern brand of ultranationalism. Um, so here, um, can you please tell me um, about my time? Are we okay? Yeah, you have two more minutes. Okay, you sorry, I'll try to. Thank you so much. <laughs> so here uh, we are left uh, with an open question. There are still many um, unknowns because uh, he doesn't speak clearly of them and um, he does leave us with an open uh, question. Um, how should post-war Japanese ethics actually grapple with and overcome the legacy of this um, uh, deep uh, political nature of uh, Confucian-related uh, discourses um, in, in the interwar period? So on this point, um, again, he doesn't explicitly pronounce himself, but that distinction he makes between uh, the creative force of universalistic Confucian ideas and the limiting force of authority sanctioned ones throughout recent history uh, does seem to suggest that path forward. So um, if each um, period has that multi-layered aspect, which consists of that epoch's um, creative side and its traditional side, which never really get discarded, but constantly evolve under the specific limitations imposed by the spatio-temporal uh, context, then there are two important aspects um, that emerge with regard to Confucianism in Watsuji. Uh, first, if Confucian ethics has penetrated into the fabric of an epoch, it will necessarily continue to exist and be active in that society simultaneously and divergently as both a traditional, uh, but also a creative force. And um, this, um, again, if we go back to um, the two strands of Confucianism he identified in the Edo period, we see that the Kangaku Confucianism uh, got its um, obtuseness from its subordination to political authority. The same happened for the Hayashi school in the Edo period, but the same also happened for the Mito school and the Confucianesque sounding, mor uh, the Confucianesque morality of the Meiji period. Whereas um, Minshu Confucianism um, always um, looked for universalistic uh, values. So um, in this streak, it always um, acted as a creative responsiveness to social change. So um, my apologies. So um, following this, the second aspect uh, Watsuji's framework seems to suggest is that although this Confucian ethical thought continues to exist throughout uh, subsequent historical periods, it will necessarily evolve under that, uh, the same limitations, uh, the historical uh, geographical 
uh, context it appears in. And consequently, um, our manner of defining must, must also be flexible enough to allow for these kind of uh, irregularities. So um, one example of such a relevant historical limitation is the specific character of Meiji intellectual history, which uh, we don't seem to, uh, to talk about enough, especially in um, uh, Confucian focused um, studies. Following the sudden exposure to that multitude of alternative philosophical schools in that period, uh, local philosophical traditions have also entered a, a new stage of development where a certain renegotiation and fragmentation became um, inevitable. And Confucianism would have gone through the same thing. So um, when Watsuji gives us this less definitive diagnostics of um, Confucianism, um, it does seem a little more promising because um, it allows us to move beyond saying that, um, you know, Confucianism um, became taboo in post-war Japan, and there's there's no point, there's no relevance, uh, no philosophical relevance to it. Um, if we stay within Watsuji's framework, um, we can look for new ways to define and describe uh, occurrences of Confucian um, ethical thinking. We can no longer um, just use the purest views which seek to define Confucianism today just the way um, they defined Confucianism during the Edo period. And that category of Confucianism itself is um, now under investigation, in, uh, um, under discussion. Um, with each passing period, um, we have to um, allow for um, more conceptual porousness. We have to learn how to investigate certain um, separate strands of um, separate ideas, more than looking at Confucianism as a system that is illiberal in nature, it's um, better and easier for us and um, in the end more philosophically um, valuable to look at, to, to allow for uh, multiple manifestations, multiple uh, ways in which Confucianism would have um, 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 interacted and uh, responded to um, modern philosophy and postmodern philosophy. And sorry, I'm really sorry. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I didn't speak too fast. It was very interesting. Thank you very much.